Welcome to the Three Edge Week in Review for the week of September 12th. I'm Fritz Foltz, the Chief Investment Strategist here at Three Edge, and sitting in for Steve Cucchiaro today is Eric Beagleisen, Director of Investment Research and Deputy Chief Investment Officer here at Three Edge Asset Management. Today, Eric and I will be seeking to shed some light on this past Tuesday's report on the Consumer Price Index for August, which jolted markets. The S&P 500 declined by over 4% its worst day since June 2020, and the NASDAQ fell by almost 5.5%, its largest daily decline since March of 2020 and the outbreak of the global pandemic. So today, Eric and I will discuss how the three-edge proprietary model of the global capital markets helps us to analyze the potential for inflation and how inflation may impact the different asset classes that make up our broad global investment universe. But first, let's consider what may have caused Tuesday's equity market decline. And I would say, for me, there are sort of really two reasons. Uh, I feel like first, clearly investors' expectations had gotten ahead of themselves in thinking that the worst was over, inflation would decline fairly rapidly from here. And this narrative picked up uh, steam because there was a report on July that we showed a deceleration in inflation. And I think people sort of glommed onto that and said, okay, great, here we go, we're coming down from here. And as oftentimes, as we know, Eric, the most extreme sell-offs can come when investors' expectations run head-on into the economic reality on the ground. And that, I think, is what happened uh, on, on Tuesday. And so this report, you know, it seemed to throw water, cold water on the peak inflation narrative. Uh, raising doubts as to whether the Fed will be able to engineer a soft landing for the economy as it seeks to combat inflation. And the other, you know, frankly, the other contributing factor on the sell-off was you can find in the data of the report, because in particular, the month-over-month -month rise in core inflation, which excludes food and energy, and which is, you know, as we've said, the one of the Fed's preferred inflation measures. So core CPI, which had uh, declined down to 0.3% in July. In the August report, core CPI went right back up to around 0.6% month over month. And that on an annual basis is 6.3% in August versus the July number, which was 5.9%. And that was certainly not what investors, uh, nor the Fed, you know, were, were hoping to see. So, let me turn things over to Eric here. You know, I mean, clearly, our, you know, investors' expectations were at least temporarily dashed by this recent report. And, you know, again, it's a good reason why it's helpful to have a model and the discipline, you know, to uh, to rely on the model as we make investment decisions, as opposed to having to see, you know, news comes out, the market reacts, uh, and so on. So I think, though, it would be helpful if you could shed some light on, well, how does the model help us to understand inflation and how does it impact, you know, the various asset classes and the like? So I'll turn things over to you on that. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Fritz. So the model incorporates inflation, not just in the U.S., but all the major economies that we model and its impacts on the prospects for asset class performance in a variety of ways. As you'll recall, we have three main edges of our investment modeling. We have these longer term valuation factors, these more intermediate term global macroeconomic factors, and shorter term investor behavioral factors. Within those intermediate term factors, we've specifically modeled an equity factor we call inflation deviation. Mm. This factor, it rewards economies with well-behaved inflation or inflation heading back towards uh, the given central bank's desired range. You know, while it punishes those with inflation outside the range or inflation heading in the wrong direction. So, for example, if we if we were to see U.S. CPI heading back down in a meaningful way, despite still being elevated, this factor would provide a positive contribution to the U.S. equity outlook. Um, beyond that, we see inflation measures show up in our real asset economic modeling as well. So with regard to gold and commodities, we examine uh, real rates. And we measure this in multiple ways. First, we have real rates as determined by the market's expectations for future inflation, which is driven by the yield on tips or treasury inflation protected securities. You know, this real yield started the year at about minus 110 or minus 1.1% 1, 1 and was recently at around positive 100 or 1% or positive. That's a, that's a big move uh, in real yields and that negatively impacts our outlook or real assets, broadly speaking. 
using this measure also provides the market's expectation for future inflation, uh, which on a 10-year tips bond is around 2.5%, down from a high of just over 3% back in April. Uh, this is the market believing, therefore, that the Fed will be successful at taming inflation by bringing it back down to their 2% range, and also that they'll do it fairly quickly, as, as this suggests inflation will average 2.5% per year over the next 10 years. Even the one-year break-even inflation rate is 2.3%. Um, you know, we don't necessarily think the market has priced this one correctly, considering inflation is well north of that. Right. Um, the other real yield in the model we examine is constructed by taking the nominal treasury minus the prevailing CPI. And this measure provides a very different outlook, considering the 10-year nominal treasury is around 3.4% and CPI is north of 8%, providing a deeply negative real yield measure, which is actually a positive for real assets. Right. So then with regard to our investor behavioral factors, we have two stages here, and inflation features prominently in the first stage. In this first stage, we have what we like to call uh, uh, canaries like a canary in a coal mine providing a signal of danger ahead. We, we look at a number of shorter term focused measures to help identify the potential for drawdowns and risk assets. These include looking at measures of inflation in the short term, as well as the rate of change of these measures to gain a sense of the momentum of inflation. Mm -hmm. And should one of these canaries turn on, the model is able to haircut or even zero out an incoming projection uh, from an otherwise positive or bullish projection. And that helps mitigate the risk of portfolio drawdowns by excluding these assets or reducing their contribution uh, uh, to allocation in the portfolio. Of course, we don't love to use CPI, given that it is a government-furnished statistic. It's lagged by its very design, and it's subjected to restatement as well as redefinition from time to time as the basket changes. But nonetheless, it is widely followed and tracked, and therefore, we too need to be aware of it and respond to it as market participants do. Excellent. All right. So, I mean, so... Uh, th obviously, that's a lot. That's a very comprehensive approach to understanding uh, inflation. And just so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, based on that, just briefly, what would you say that the model is telling us now, looking forward, uh, in terms of inflation, and particularly in the U.S.? Yeah. yeah. So, with regard to that economic factor in the equity models, that inflation deviation factor that, that I referenced earlier, we are seeing, you know, either a net neutral impact on equities or an outright negative contribution. Uh, in the U.S. and Europe, for example, it is a it is a negative contributor to the overall projection. Uh, in the case of real assets, whether looking at real yield constructed by either met, met method that I mentioned before, the rate of change of those real yields. Uh, is positive. Uh, it's it's going up, which is a negative for gold and commodities. Uh, in terms of the behavioral factors and the inflation-focused canary that we spoke about before, this provides that early warning, you know, indicator. We we were seeing that pop up and activate last year about mm -hmm. the dangers of rising inflation, while the Fed continues to suggest it was transient. And since then, we've periodically seen that canary be activated, particularly in the U.S. and Europe, but. You know, Japan, China, and even India all have been uncomfortably close to activating as well. So that's something we'll no doubt be keeping a very close eye on. Excellent. Okay. So the last thing that um, we like to cover in the videos, as you know, is to say, okay, based on what we just talked about in the CPI and the outlook for inflation, what might investors consider in terms of their own portfolios? And so I, I guess the way I would summarize that would just be to say that, you know, based on our model research, you know, we continue to believe that it pays to be to continue, frankly, to be worried more about investment uh, investment risk in the months ahead. And as we saw when we looked at the view from the edge, the latest report, you know, all of those equity asset classes were in the negative category. So, and and as you said, you know, if you follow our videos, you know, we've been talking about inflation since at least the middle of last year. You know, and exactly as you said, you know, the research was indicating that we felt it was probably going to be less transitory than the Fed believed or perhaps the Fed hoped. And the evidence continues to, um, you know, prove that to be the case. So it's entire, but the other, only other thing I would say before I bring you back in for your final comments is, you know, it is possible that the 9.1% print, which I believe was two months ago, mm. maybe that will be the peak, if you will. You know, maybe that will be, uh, the highest CPI print that we will see. And then we'll see the more transitory aspects of inflation could ease over the coming months. But 
you have these stickier measures of inflation, such as wages and houses and housing, which, and which basically particularly means rents. And those take much longer to come down. It could keep overall inflation higher uh, for much longer. So that's one thing. And next, you know, as Fed Chair Powell said um, at the uh, symposium, why can't I think of where it was? Because Jackson, Jackson Hole. Hole. Thank you very much. <laughs> at Jackson Hole, the Fed is, you know, very committed to combating inflation, quote unquote, until the job is done. So you have they're going to probably continue to raise uh, interest rates, probably 75 basis points next week. The QT, uh, quantitative tightening, is just beginning to set in. Uh, and that's really get ramped up starting uh, in, in this month. So all of those things considered, um, you know, we we definitely think that now is a good time to remain cautious and, you know, frankly, avoid the jarring volatility that we very well may get through uh, at least the rest of this year. So now I'll turn it back to you, though, for any last thoughts. Yeah, I would just note that the Fed's own projection for future inflation has the median projection for this year at just over 5%, 2.5% in 23, just over 2% in 2024, and then 2% for the long term after that. And I guess, A, you know, to me, that seems somewhat optimistic. Uh, but B, more importantly, what, what's going to stop inflation at 2%? You know why might it why might it not continue even lower from there, particularly right. if they end up being so aggressive and continue that aggressiveness without without waiting the appropriate lag uh, or wait time to see how their policy interventions have uh, manifest and percolate through the economy. So mm -hmm. I just want to kind of plant that seed in folks' head uh, if they continue this aggressive tightening. Excellent, great. Well, Eric, thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, could be an interesting fourth quarter of 2022. So that will do it for Eric and me, Steve Cucciaro and I will be back next week for another edition of the Three Edge Week in Review. In the meantime, as a reminder, all our videos always available on our Three Edge YouTube channel. In addition, all our videos and written commentaries always available on our website, and that is threeedgeam.com. So until next time, on behalf of Eric and everyone here at Three Edge, Thanks for listening.